Bill J. A perfect fall morning here in Newport, Rhode Island, in a perfect car for a morning cruise. Well, I fell in love with these when I was a kid. I worked at a foreign car dealership, and uh, I got a chance to get, buy one of these for $100 on a trade-in. <laughs> Not a convertible, a coupe, a 220S. I mean, it had a lot of miles, a few dings. Just, it, you know, $100 is really $1,000 back then. Right. So. Uh, I got a chance to experience the Mercedes experience, just the quality and the way it shifted. I mean, this is a 1957, and it's funny, when I look at this, this looks like an American version of a Mercedes. Flashy paint, big white wall tires. Mine was sort of a slate gray with black wall tires and hubcaps. Uh, rather sedate looking car, but the build quality, just moving this shifter is one of the great pleasures. It's a four speed on the column, everything that, it's a bit like a watch, it does this, you know. When I was doing The Tonight Show, I had an old man named uh, Victor Christian on The Tonight Show. He was 106 years old, <laughs> and he was the world's oldest car salesman. He worked at Arcadia wow. Ford in Arcadia, California. And I figured, I'm gonna impress him and drive my 1932 Packard to the show. Mm -hmm. So I drove my 32 Packard, and he pulled up, you know, and, hey, what, what, what year is that car? I said, 1932 Packard. He goes, 32, after 15, they were nothing but shit! You know, and, he, and, he, and he yelled that out, you know, I thought, and I thought, well, it was the ramblings of a crazy old man, you know. But then I got a 1911 and a 1913 Packard, and I went, oh, this is what the old man was talking about. When I, all the gears were hand lapped. When you shifted it, weren't I mean, it wasn't powerful or fast, but- Precise. Every, precise, everything just, I, I didn't have to do anything. I just moved the gear shift and it engaged perfectly. Obviously, it was not synchromesh, so right. you had to use the clutch. And the, but, but just very deliberate. And, and, so, and the steering, everything, I was amazed at how good that it was. It was a, they were both unrestored cars. They were a bit rough looking, but mechanically, they were perfect. And that's the feeling I get with this. I mean, it is just precise. Plus, I love this era. Earlier in America, right about now for Mercedes-Benz, before power anything, because everything- When you really felt yeah, what the car was doing ev all the yeah, time. And very they directly. wanted the car to be the perfect combination of steering and braking without as much effort as possible. And that's what this does. Look at this shit, just drop your hands. It slips right into gear, oh. These cars are absolutely remarkable. And when you think about the accomplishment of Mercedes, that uh, after the war and their factories completely devastated, the company came back um, in the late 40s, 1947, 1948, uh, building their pre-war car, the 170, and then their first post-war big car, the 300, and then this was the first modern post-war Mercedes, 1953, so-called Ponton cars, right. because they were the first cars with the fully integrated fenders. They didn't have that 1930s look. Right. And. Uh, so uh, semi-unitized bodies, and but still these very special handcrafted, largely hand-finished, coupes and convertibles that were just the absolute top of, of the main line. The wood trim and all of this that, that really looks back to the whole era of real craftsmanship. You couldn't find something like this in an American car in 1957, that's for sure. And it's funny, this cost way more than the competing Chrysler 300, a Cadillac <laughs> or Lincoln, yet it has a 99 horsepower yeah. inline six engine. Six cylinder, wind up windows. Right. Uh, no, no power steering, no air conditioning, no power, had nothing. I mean, this couldn't compete with American cars on any level except quality. If it, It's the difference between having a bottle of beer or some fancy wine, you know? And Americans preferred a good bottle of beer, you know? Exactly. And that was sort of the difference, as I would have at the time. But I, uh, I just love driving this thing. All the little unique features, how the, the turn, turn signal. signals are integrated into the horn ring and little things like that. And the fact that it's no power steering and you've got a good size wheel that helps you just sort of get around corners, fantastic. And remember also, of course, this car is being developed at the same time that Mercedes was beginning their return to racing with the W198, right. the 300 SL in 1952. So. Um, there's also a lot, you don't really think about 
the 300 SL and the 300 SLR and, and the great uh, Milla Milia victory of, of uh, uh, Sterling Moss in 55 in connection with a luxury touring car like right. this. But it's the mentality. It's what Mercedes built, how they built everything to be very precise and reliable and strong and durable. And yet, you know, incredibly entertaining as well. You know, it's funny. The first new car I ever bought, because it's the only Mercedes you could get in America, was a 1983 turbo diesel. Mm -hmm. And it had uh, all the luxury features and everything. And one thing I loved about Mercedes-Benz, especially in this era, were these thick, padded, heavy seats. Yes. This leather gave off a rich aroma, mm -hmm. you know. So when I got my Mercedes, I thought, what, what kind of seats? I mean, it was okay, but it was, it was modern leather that was treated and, of course, right. sealed. Like, you know, people that buy high f hide food for a modern car, <laughs> wasting their money, because it, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't, it doesn't breathe. Soak right, it doesn't exactly. soak in. It doesn't soak in. But this, you just get that, that aromatic smell, and it's, oh, it, it's just fantastic. And there's nothing as comfortable as these, with the exception of a Citroën, there's nothing as comfortable as these big Mercedes seats. I think that Mercedes also understood, the Mercedes designers also understood the relationship between ride and seating. Because the, the riding experience in the car is a combination of the suspension of the car, the comfort of the seats. You want something that's, that's comfortable and yielding, but not so soft that you slip, you know, you sink into them, because that's yeah. not the point. Nor something that feels like you're in a torture chamber that right. holds you upright like this and, and doesn't give you any uh, compliance at all. You feel well supported. It's the kind of car I've got sort of my drive across the country test that I always think about when I'm when I'm in a car. Is this a car that I want to sit in for hours at a time driving across right. the country? And this is certainly one of them. I would love to drive across the country in a car like yeah. this. Well, it's funny to me. The worst thing that ever happened to luxury cars is Nurburgring, <laughs> because everybody feels they have to get around there in under ten seconds, and you know, uh, Cadillac. Everybody they go Nurburgring and. They, so you wind up with a hard riding car that's not really a sports car. That's not. A, I, I don't get it. You know. I mean, how sit, often do you actually? Yeah, sit, get up in the morning and drive the Nurburgring right, right. Uh, on your way to the cleaners or to breakfast. I don't think Citroen has ever been near the Nurburgring. That's <laughs> why when you get a DS or an SM, oh my God, they're just so comfortable to drive. And of course, it's very interesting as well thinking about Mercedes in the American market. And the fact that this particular car, the way the trim is finished, this is a factory two-toned car, so it had extra chrome trim to delineate the color separation. Right. And that was very much aimed at the U.S. market. And, of course, they were distributed in the U.S. at this time by Studebaker. Right. And so, you know, that's an interesting thing to think about as well. Um, going into a Studebaker dealer and saying, do I turn left to the Mercedes-Benzes or do I turn right to the Studebakers right. and the Packards? Um, it would have been an interesting uh, conundrum for the Studebaker dealers of the time, that's for sure. Well, also, you have to remember, nobody here knew Mercedes-Benz other than the war, so there's a lot of bitter feelings about buying German stuff. And secondly, well, you know, like, my favorite thing is when people come back from Europe, they go, Jay, you know, Mercedes are taxis over there. That's how rich they are. Well, you know, you know Mercedes-Benz was just a foreign car with a six-cylinder engine. It didn't even, it wasn't even in the, in the class, at least to most Americans, of the Cadillac or the Imperial. And yet, it's very funny that you bring up that story because I find it fascinating that Mercedes, probably alone among manufacturers, could actually sell cars through a range that included cars used for taxis up to the most expensive, luxurious, hand-finished cars and sports cars. Right. Yeah. It never affected anybody's impression right. of the brand. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that would be tough, I think, with a lot of other companies. Oh, but boy, this, this is a wonderful car to drive. And you know, you have to also see vehicles like this and the roads that they were meant to drive on. Yes. This car only has a hair under 100 horsepower. But at 45 to 50 miles an hour, it's perfect. I think it probably would get a little buzzy at 75 or 80. On yeah, you wouldn't want to cruise. Although these are designed for, you know, the yeah, German no, Autobahns. That, that's so, true. So that's they true. Could, and it was very interesting, actually, looking in the, um, the owner's manuals of cars like this, where they list the top speed and then they list the cruising speed. And the, top, and the cruising speed is usually two or three miles per hour under the top speed. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, 
this this car is is was rated for a top speed of 99 miles per hour yeah. which i thought was quite interesting because again typically a manufacturer would say if my car can get to 99 i'll tell them when it goes to 100. right <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly i mean the classic example of that was volkswagen the top speed was the cruising speed right you get on the autobahn you put your foot down and you went 72 miles an hour <laughs> and the time zero to 72 when you arrive. Right. <laughs> oh my God, this is just such a nice shifting driving car. And you know, the, the fun thing I love, this dashboard is really just a, a, a huge part of a tree. Yes. I mean, it's not even like veneer. It's literally a chunk of wood. This looks like the whole trunk of a tree in here. I and mean, it's, it's absolutely incredibly finished. I mean, the, the figuring of the wood, the matching of the uh, yeah. of the grains it's just uh, you know the detail is 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 everywhere i mean yes this car was horrifyingly expensive when it was new but the good thing was too that you saw where all the money you spent went and how much was this would this have been like 6 or 7000 dollars in 50 it would have been about 6000 dollars so you, um, you figure a cadillac was well you get a good cadillac for under five probably or five right yeah about that because the the it was quite outrageous uh continental mark ii and the cadillac eldorado brum were ten thousand dollar cars and those are more than a rolls Royce. Right? exactly and yeah. so again with those you got uh, every bit of creature comfort and uh and convenience that you could possibly get which you did not get on this Mercedes. it must have been tough to sell these you know you got some veteran limping into a dealership <laughs> You know, he's just won World War II. Oh, by the way, here's the latest German off. Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I had some experience with those uh, a few years ago. That would uh, yeah, that would be a, the ocean. That yeah. would be a hard sell. But it is funny. I had to smile when I saw it sitting here because it just looked like something that had been tarted up for the American market. You know, the English did that well. Like the classic example, the Daimler. Let's put fins on it, Nigel. American loves fins. Put chrome on with a troll, put a, just, get, get, just slap the chrome on, da, 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 put a little sort of V8 in it, and oh, we'll sell a million of them. Americans will love the thing. You know, it's just very funny. And a car that has this kind of elegance and execution is perfect for arriving at our house for today. Yeah, right? what are we looking at today? I'm curious. You know, I could skip the house altogether and drive this, but, <laughs> but what house are we going to? I think the house will be worth it when we arrive. Yeah. It's a house called Vernon Court but it's actually the Gambrel House. I know this place. This is the uh, Museum of... Um... The National Museum of American Illustration. Oh yeah, I took my wife here. This is a fabulous place. It's interesting to see what magazines were like before photography, because exactly. you had these... Master artists. Oh my God, Gordon Crosby, of course, my favorite in the English magazine. He was the best one who could uh, detail speed in a, in, a, in a drawing. He had speed lines, because most photography, could not catch speeding cars. The wheels always looked oval and, you know, it, it didn't quite work. You know, I can't get used to the colors and the chrome. It doesn't, it, it's so tarted up. It's like Audrey Hepburn and Hot Pants. It's attractive, but it doesn't seem elegant, is it? You know, I'm not used to seeing it. Well, I tell you, when I worked at, at the Foreign Motors in Boston, we got a red Rolls Royce in, and it sat for a year. We couldn't give it away. We finally shipped to California, and it sold in two weeks. You know, this was not an East Coast color. This is really... It's not a New England color, no. but it is a very Newport color, remember? Well, I guess that's this true. Is, this, is, this is Newport. But yeah. let's take a look at what makes this car go. Speaking of escargot, <laughs> so that 2.2 liter, and it's got two carburetors yes, on it. Yes, dual carburetors. Yeah. And one of the things which is also very interesting to, to notice, we talk about the uh, finishes in the Mercedes. Right. And you can see under the hood of this car, there's nothing flashy. It's, 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 a, it's a working room. Right. Oh, it's just a wonderful car to drive. It's just so solid. I always love this period because it's the halfway point in the development of the automobile. Mm -hmm. If you figure 1900 to now, this is, and from then to now, this is just about the halfway point. And really quite advanced in, 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 for its time. 
you think about the development of the first 60 years of yeah. the car as, as mode of transport, it is quite remarkable. And it ties in quite well with the house that we've arrived in, Jay. Yeah, tell us about this house. And I, I've been in this because it's a wonderful museum. It's the Museum of Illustration, which is fascinating because it's just what magazines were before photography was in widespread use. And they would have all these fabulous artists, many of them famous. Norman Rockwell certainly the most famous. Paris. Yes, all of that. J.C. Leyendecker. Yeah, and it, you see these magazine covers that are just magnificent works of art. It, it's really an era that will never come back, I'm sure. And the concept of this museum, the National Museum of American Illustrative Art, is terrific because the building in which it's housed, this wonderful house, is designed by Carrere and Hastings, mm -hmm. who also designed Henry Clay Frick's house in Manhattan, which is now the Frick Collection. Okay. So it was designed purposely as a home which could be converted into a museum. And that's how this wonderful house lives today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Judy and Lawrence Cutler established this museum and restored this house and have the museum on the main floor of the house and the rest of the home remains a residence. Well, wow, that's great. But the story of this house is also a fascinating one because as happened not often, but not rarely in Newport, this house was built by a single woman. It was built for Anna Van Nest Gambrel, mm -hmm. whose husband had passed away a few years before this house was completed. And as I said, built by Carrere and Hastings in the typical French chateau style. But Carrere and Hastings were also noted most for their great public buildings. They designed the New York Public Library in New York. Right. They designed the Senate and House Office Building in Washington. And we're very interested in how buildings sat within an urban setting. And although they did not design the gardens, they also worked very carefully with the landscape designers so that the interior rooms of the house line up exactly with the gardens, which is a very, what is considered a modern uh, interpretation of the house living inside and outside as one seamless unit. Yeah, yeah, interesting. While the exterior of Vernon Court is rather restrained, the interiors give way to a more opulent expression. As is typical in the French chateau style, the house is flooded with light. The manner in which the great works of American illustrative art are integrated into the interior of Vernon Court can be seen to dramatic effect in the circular main staircase, in which is hung the spectacular series of mural panels by Maxfield Parrish of the Florentine Fete, so much at home in this setting that they seem to have been created for it. Vernon Court also shows up its illustrative beauty by literally bringing in the garden with the paintings in the South and North Loggias by James Finn. The South Loggia portrays spring, which has been wonderfully preserved. The North Loggia shows fall, which unfortunately had suffered water damage in the past. The owners are studying the preserved remnants of the painting with the aim of eventual restoration, which should see the home shine even brighter with art. And also unusually for one of these grand houses in Newport, it's very simple. It's designed after uh, an early uh, 18th century French chateau design, but it's in stucco. No flashy marble and, and figured brick and anything like that. Right. It's very elemental, and that's something that is also, um, again, in common with the Mercedes. Great style, but simple. Well, you've got these rather, these got these columns here with some sort of, uh, I call it Jim Crackery. <laughs> A bit of Jim Crackery around it there, but yeah. I see what you mean. It is decorated because decoration was very, very important. They studied at the Beaux-Arts in Paris. So they knew that they wanted to have a house that has surface interest, but not something that immediately catches the eye. There are little details for you to see as you take the house in. It's more about the form of the house right. itself. And uh, it's also an interesting point about the form because the second car we're going to look at today is all about form in a very surprising way. And it's a car that's not a very fancy, not a very expensive car on the street. A 1969 Camaro. A Camaro. All right, I'm curious to see how this fits in with this Museum of Illustration. This is a 1969 Camaro custom called the mule and it's a really interesting thing because a lot of people have built custom Camaros right but this one was built by Mark Stilo who was a GM designer 
Oh, okay. And so in addition to being a very high performance car, we'll take a look at the engine in a little bit, a 388 cubic inch twin turbo 1001 horsepower V8. Wow. Um, so it's a 327 with a stroker carrier? Exactly. Yeah. With a very sophisticated uh, multi-link uh, suspension in place of the uh, live axle and all that. So it's a car designed certainly to go and handle, but what Mark was able to do as well was to refine the design to the point that this is what the GM designers wanted a 69 Camaro to look like. The panel fit, the details, everything is slightly tweaked to make it a little simpler and a little more elemental. Yeah, and I like the fact that it's a color that shows off the design more than the flat. You know, it's not a two-tone with stripes, so you're focusing on, wow, look at that color, look at those racing stripes. You can really, at first you don't notice this, this hood where obviously air can escape. And of course, you've got the louvers, the louvers here too, which is something, you know, this goes back to the 63 Corvette, which had the fake the louvers fake ones. here. You know, so they got real louvers here to relieve pressure to keep the front end from coming off the ground. Uh, I'm thinking, what else is different? Well, if you look at the drip mill rail moldings, our body color. Oh yeah, of course, yes. And same, smoothed yeah. out. The taillights even are the same taillight shape, but with flat trim instead of the, uh, the raised trim. And everything is just fit a little, together a little more carefully. You talk about the color. It's very interesting too, because typically designs are presented by the design departments and manufacturers in silver. Right. So you're looking just at the shape and not distracted by, well, I don't like red, I don't like blue, I don't I like yellow. I thought they did it in white. Didn't it used to be white? Silver. Silver was the, was the, was the uh, preferred color because you get some reflection as well. Right. So you can see lots of shadows on the lines. And it's also quite interesting because obviously as a high performance hot rod car, it's got very big, very sticky tires. Right. But even the wheels are very present, but not overly so. But all the creases like along the side here, this is all stock, correct? It is all stock, however, it has all been highlighted to exactly match and line up the way the designers had intended the 69 Camaro to do it. And those creases behind the door, those are not factory, are they? Is that? The little vents? Yeah. Yes, the, on the RS you would find that's those. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right, exactly. yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, but they, again, they would be applied uh, pieces rather than uh, molded into the uh, body. Let's take a look at the engine. Yeah, open it up. Do we have one on each side? On each side, you push down on that. Oh, push down on Push down on that. Okay, oh, there we go. Wow, look at that, okay. <laughs> so you've got twin turbos. Twin turbos and, and the headers are just absolutely amazing to look at. And you still got air conditioning and everything, but yeah. Got your intercooler here in front, the twin turbos. I, I'm, there's got to be some lag with these. I would imagine that the throttle response is going to be uh, something fairly uh, surprising and awfully sudden. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Wow. And look at all the hand welds here on these homemade valve covers and this piece here. Very nice. And it's, uh, it's got the look somehow of either a, a, a spaceship's power plant or some sort of alien creature, you know, with these. Yeah. And nozzles it, coming out. And it's obviously a real car because it's got the Power Tour stickers on the on the rear window, which means it's done. The, the Power Tour is something Hot Rod Magazine. I think they still do, and it, it travels around the country. And so this thing's got a lot of miles on it. It's a beautiful car. It's an absolutely astonishing car, and one which uh, certainly demands great respect from anyone that drives it. And what do we have here? And we've got a proper gearbox. Well, Six-speed uh, gearbox from a Viper. Very nice. Oh, from a Viper. From a Viper, yes. Ooh, wow, that's got to raise some I'm not bro. quite sure how well that went over at GM, but nonetheless, they actually did give this car a GM design award yeah. for excellence, and uh, it certainly deserves it. And how long ago was it built? Probably, what, 14 years ago, 15 it's years ago? built about that time, yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Beautiful car. And then, for something completely different, but an element of style and something that was very important to Carrera and Hastings, which was urban design right. and space utilization. Oh, this is the tenuous connection to the, yeah. Today's tenuous connection. Yeah. Let's go take a look at something very different than this Camaro. All right.
What year is it? 58, 59? This is 1959. Its title is in 1959, um, although apparently, technically, the uh, Trasformabile model, which is this model with these, right. the hard top with the fully retractable roof, wasn't actually introduced until 1960. Okay. But this is a U.S. delivery model, which is also makes it quite rare and unusual because it has the U.S. legal large headlights. The right. European models have the smaller European headlights. And um, it's really very much a Fiat Cinquecento, right. but designed with a great deal of style. And it's also quite an interesting thing. Designing a small car that has some style to it is very difficult. It's much easier to design a big car or a sports car because when you have a small car, you have to be really careful with the details in the form. But does it have any more style than the equivalent Fiat, really? Is it more stylish? Well, think? certainly the equivalent Fiat doesn't have things like those wonderful chrome speed strips on the back right. and the, uh, the coupe roof. Uh, well, this, this is, is called a transformable, right? Yes. And the Italian word is... Trasformabile. Trasformabile. Yeah, it's almost like, like Mission Impossible language, remember? <laughs> remember when you watch Mission Impossible and to show you a foreign country, it would be Telephone Z. Exactly. It would be Telephone Z. So Americans go, oh, that must mean telephone in whatever stupid line. Precisely. Yeah. You just yeah. add a, an O or an I. Right, exactly. Um, exactly. And uh, it was also quite interesting, the, the bewildering range of models that uh, they made in, in, this, in this car. They had this thrust for mobile. They had an actual full convertible. They right. had a two-door sedan. And then they had a little station wagon as well. Well, I see why they went out of business. Because to me, it uses all Fiat internals, but it costs Twice as much as a Fiat? Half again as much as a standard okay, Cinquecento. Half again as a, but and the idea style. was, I thought the Fiat was just as pretty. I mean, to me, I've got a Topolino, which is just a rounder version of this, which I think is actually more attractive. I mean, I could see why it didn't last very long. You'd pay another 50% on top for a little different body. To, be, to have local style, because you didn't want to be one of those hundreds of thousands of people that had a standard Cinquecento. Well, okay, all right. But the entire point, too, of, of these cars, which is something that's hard for us to grasp in the U.S., um, especially because those people who live in the cities use lots of taxi cabs. Right. In a European city, however, people are using their own transportation and have a car like this that you could park anywhere, that you could really fit easily and handle easily in traffic on narrow roads, was very important. And that's something that Carrera and Hastings took great pains to, to, to think about in their designs in terms of urban planning and how a city would work. Yeah. And so it's, a, uh, it's quite an interesting thing. An observation that, that I've often made is how people use their cars in the cities. When they have a big car and they're not quite sure where it ends and where it stops, yeah. and you have large spaces in traffic, you can get twice as many cars in the same space in a European city or in a Japanese city than you can in an American city, and the reason why are cars like this. And it's really just one step up from a Vespa, pretty much, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. It, it almost has a Vespa look to it. Vespa produced a car for a short time. They did, time. the Vespa 400, yeah, yes, and, and that, that was, was a micro car. This is a mini car. Yeah, so yeah, so that. that's even smaller than this one, yeah. <laughs> exactly, but it's got an amazing amount of space inside. Now, this is a, what, five, it's about 500 cc, two-cylinder or four-cylinder? 479 cc, uh, two-cylinder air-cooled. Oh, it is two, okay. Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, Standard Fiat power plant, correct? Standard Fiat power plant, not modified for performance at all. It's interesting, because Fiat originally had a four-cylinder 600 cc, correct. and then they switched to a two-cylinder, and that was water-cooled. This is an air-cooled, much like a Volkswagen. And they ran this uh, simultaneously for quite a while. In fact, uh, by the time you get to the 1980s and the Fiat Panda, the first one they also offered, one model was a two-cylinder air-cooled and the other model was a four-cylinder water-cooled. So All it was right. something that they did fairly often. And again, thinking about the way these cars were used in city environments and for maintenance purposes, a lot of people preferred the two-cylinder air-cooled. They right, were much right. simpler. Yeah, it's just easier, certainly. Oh, pretty little motor. All right, let's... Uh... Let's close her up and take her for a ride. Spin. It's actually easy to get into. It is. The suicide doors helps. And suicide has never been more appropriate. All right. This feels like the Mercedes Benz after taxes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's the uh, it is 
an incredibly upmarket example of the uh, very humble Fiat uh, Cinquecento. Yeah, I, I never understood why they built this car. I mean, Fiat already built small cars. It's a Fiat engine. Well, this, I, uh, is a, this is a joint venture. Yeah, oh, I see. And uh, so What's, for those people who wanted and needed a very small city car, but wanted a lot more style than a standard Cinquecento, which you could see absolutely everywhere, and they paid half again as much for one of these cars as you would for a standard Cinquecento, just for the style. It was purely an exercise of style. Well, it doesn't really seem like a style. Well, I guess the roof goes back, doesn't it? It the doesn't seem. Like, it doesn't seem like a stylish. I mean, it seems just like a like a small Fiat. I mean. But the design on the outside, the details of the design, the finishes here inside are much higher than that of a standard. Uh, Cinquecento. But again, it, it, it's about having something that's, it's like, why does somebody buy uh, a two-toned version of a car as opposed to the single version? Why does somebody buy a convertible over a four-door sedan? Just for that little bit of dash. But they made many, many models of the uh, Alfa Bianchi. Uh, so uh, Auto Bianchi was not a division of Fiat, a separate company? Auto Bianchi was eventually bought entirely by Fiat, right. but it was first a joint venture between Fiat and the Bianchi Motorcycle Company. Oh, okay. Bian okay. Um, and they made an addition to this uh, Trasformabile, which is the uh, coupe with the uh, steel roof beams and right. the fully opening cloth roof. Right. They also made a convertible, a full convertible, and they made the coupe, and they also made a two-door, three-door sedan. Uh, sort of like a mini station wagon. Right, right. It's my first time driving this, so you can see we don't rehearse this. We just get in the cars. Uh, this is first gear. I guess that's second gear. Now watch when I go to third gear. No, that's... That feels more like second. Let's see what happens when you go from first no. to the indicated. That definitely feels like fourth. Okay. That feels like first gear. I don't know. I can't figure it out. You, you've got to slow horsepower. <laughs> you've got to use it all. But it's also quite interesting. I, I, I imagine that you've had the same experience that I have had. When you have cars like this, that are packaged like this, like the, uh, the Austin Mini, um, where the full envelope of the car is used, you can place a car like this so much better than some of the big cars, you know? Right, right. And when you drive in Europe, in a European city, you'll see cars fit in traffic much closer together because everyone knows where their car ends. You right. can drive through an American city, and people have four feet between the cars because they have no idea where the car actually ends. Right, right, yeah. That's why I've always liked driving cars like this, because you have a very, very keen sense of where you are in the road. I mean, it's, it is so, what's the word, elemental? Is that yes, the word? Yes, absolutely. It doesn't, it just feels like a square box with four wheels, and you turn left or right. It doesn't feel it has like it has any suspension. Although it does have some rudimentary suspension. I think that, yeah, most of the uh, suspension action we're probably getting from the sidewall. It the feels tires. like a soapbox derby car with an engine in it. Yeah, and what about the handling? I love the handling of the cars like this. Well, I don't know if it handles, it just it goes around corners. I, I wouldn't say it handles. It's okay. I'm trying to figure out. I mean, is that first gear? It's a potpourri of gears again. <laughs> I mean, I guess this is all about the style, because I, I can't say it's fun to drive. I mean, it's transportation. These cars are basic transportation, but... Here's my thing. If nobody's looking, I wouldn't drive this. You know, the Mercedes... Oh, it's such a pleasure to drive. This, it's fun to be seen in. Mm. 
but it's not really fun to drive because it's not like oh oh look I mean look it doesn't I mean look how much you can before anything happens. And this is the prom dressed version of elemental transportation. It doesn't transform what the car is. Right. It just makes it look fancier. Yeah, but like a prom dress, you want to get out of it fairly quickly. <laughs> An amazing amount of torque then for a uh, 479 cc 70 well, horsepower engine. It's amazing is not the word that I would use. But yeah, it's an amazing amount of oh, amazing amount of yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, astonishing perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> Remarkable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, an adequate amount of torque. It's amazing. <laughs> Actually, of course, this is also quite interesting, this particular model, because it was originally delivered to the U.S. Yeah. And, uh, of course, as you uh, know, FDR's son was the uh, Fiat distributor. Oh, is that in the know US. that? Yes. And, uh, not, a good, not a good car for Texas. No, not at all. Again, what this car is designed to do, Jay, was to be efficient and stylish right. in the city. That's right. And uh, so it really fits in with what we saw today at Vernon Court and Carrera and Hastings, all about style and civic function. Well, let's take this, put it in the trunk of the Mercedes as a spare, and we'll go drive around. Off we'll go. Yeah.